So I will just briefly introduce myself. My name is Dr. Healy Hamilton. I am the chief scientist at NatureServe, and I'm uh, very grateful for this opportunity that has been presented to me by Dr. Miguel Fernandez, the director of NatureServe's Latin America and Caribbean Network, to introduce and say for a few minutes um, what it is that we are intending to do here. So as people join, I'll just give a very brief background about the Pulse of the Planet webinar series itself. This is an initiative of three important networks, all committed to developing, analyzing, and communicating biodiversity information for reasons from conservation to public health. So the three members of the, the Pulse of the Planet webinar series are NatureServe and our network throughout the Western Hemisphere. Uh, the GeoBon Initiative, the Group on Earth Observation, Observations Biodiversity Observation Network, and EcoHealth Alliance, uh, based in New York, but also working globally all over the world at the interface of biodiversity information and public health. So these three organizations have come together to create a webinar series on behalf of our entire community with the intention of, uh, of asking very important questions about how in fact do we measure the pulse of our planet. So today we have the great privilege to speak about uh, an a incredibly important topic that many, many people may not realize how much it is at the forefront of, uh, of the application of biodiversity information to uh, the whole range of issues that, that underpin human well being and the persistence of the diversity of life in the natural world. So today in the webinar series, we are for the first time expanding to 90 minutes and trying a format, moving from a sort of one person format to a, a series of panelists with a guided facilitator. And it is my privilege to introduce to you the facilitator and the speakers in today's panel about taxonomy. So briefly, I will say that of course, taxonomy underpins the value of all downstream information about a given element of biodiversity. So we cannot just determine the distribution of species on earth. We cannot determine the conservation status of species on earth if we do not understand ta the taxonomic entity. And we know that uh, this is an impediment, it's a challenge, and yet we have exciting new ways that we are hoping to address and break down those taxonomic impediments and we will hear about them today from some of the world's experts. Our guest facilitator, we are so honored to have Dr. Sandy Knapp, who is the president of the Linnaean Society and a researcher at the Natural History Museum in London. She's worked on the flora of Mesoamerica inventory in Central America, and she is also um, an expert on the very large and diverse genus Solanum. She served uh, with the International Association of Plant Taxonomists and has contributed to the IPBES Task Force on Knowledge and Data. Uh, we are um, very honored to have Dr. Knapp uh, imminently qualified to be facilitating today. She's also been awarded the Linnaean Medal for Service to Science. Uh, Dr. Knapp will be moderating an expert panel from all over the world. Uh, one of those panelists is Dr. Donald Hoburn, who uh, we, we know well from his pioneering leadership uh, as the executive director of the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. He's also been president of the Taxonomic Databases Working Group. He's been on the advisory boards of GeoBon and also another important biodiversity informatics initiative called iDigBio. Uh, and so he's currently executive secretary for the International Barcode of Life Consortium and also involved in the uh, as an international engagement officer for Species 2000. So uh, in addition to that, he's contributed to Atlas of Living Australia. So for many, many years, uh, Donald has been deeply involved in the biodiversity informatics community and of course grappling with issues of taxonomy. Uh, we are fortunate from Australia to have Dr. Maria Marta Siliano, 
She is a professor at the La Plata National University in Argentina and a scientist from the Argentine National Research Council. She is a world expert on the systematics and biogeography of grasshoppers, the Orthoptera, focusing on species diversification aspects. And she's also committed to the design and implementation of web applications that can help taxonomists in sharing and managing biodiversity data using the web as a tool. We are fortunate to have with us Dr. Alan Weekly, who is a long-term associate of the NatureServe Network. He is the director of the University of North Carolina Herbarium and the North Carolina Botanical Garden. He's author of uh, one of the, flor the, the, the flora of the southeastern US, which is one of our most uh, plant diverse areas in the United States. He's a plant taxonomist, a community ecologist, and a conservationist. Uh, and he is a, a trustee and advisor of both public and private conservation granting organizations that has helped oversee $400 million of land conservation grants. And finally, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Beckett Sterner, an assistant professor at Arizona State University. He studies the social epistemology of pluralism. So what is the knowledge that we need to get things done while we differ in our fundamental aspects of thinking, our fundamental ways of thinking? So coming from a very interesting background and different perspective, Dr. Sterner investigates this, this type, these set of questions in biology where globally coordinating data intensive research is key to addressing societal challenges such as taxonomy and biodiversity loss. So he's bringing this novel approach to pluralism in the information age by emphasizing the social dimension of mathematical formulations. So uh, from a completely different and interesting and innovative perspective, we're happy to have Dr. Beckett Sterner with us. I would like to thank all of the panelists and our facilitator for your time today. And with that, I will pass it on to Sandra Knapp. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you very much, Healy. And I'd like to thank NatureServe, Geobon, and the EcoHealth Alliance for giving us all this opportunity, because I think this is going to be a great place to talk about something that most people think is fantastically boring. Someone said, taxonomy is boring because it has the word tax in it, which of course it does. But actually, taxonomy is fundamentally important, as, as Healy said. And she pointed out, I, I am a taxonomist. I work on one of the largest genera of, of flowering plants, Solanum, and I'm willing to bet that all of you attendees and all of you panelists have probably either will have eaten or will eat a species of selenum today because in there are potatoes and tomatoes and aubergines or eggplants, aubergines we call them in Europe. So, so there's something that, that, that's quite important to get the taxonomy right on. And Healy mentioned something which I think I'll just put out, put out up front right now is we often talk about taxonomy versus something called systematics. And actually I call it all taxonomy, but the taxonomy that we're going to focus on today is thinking about naming things and deciding what species are. People often also think that taxonomy is all about finding and naming new species. Now, as a taxonomist, a practicing taxonomist, I'm getting better at it. I'm still not that great at it, but I'm practicing, is that it's a lot more than that. It's about deciding what we're going to give a name to. So I always like to kind of characterize this, but that taxonomy, each species name that we, we give is a hypothesis about the distribution of variation in nature. And I'll tell you a little just so story about that to explain what I mean. Is um, we often talk about the taxonomists of the past as making many mistakes because we put many of their, of their names into synonymy. We think they're the same as another name. Two people have named something that we now think is the same. But what's important about this is taxonomy, like all science, is based upon evidence. And imagine yourselves, you're a, you're a biologist in the Amazon in the 1850s, and you collect something in one end of the Amazon, and you collect a specimen at the other end of the Amazon, and they look different, and you have two things. And so you call those two things two different names. Fast forward to 2000, and we've got hundreds of specimens between those two points of area. We now say, ah, those aren't two things, 
That's one thing. Fast forward again to 2040, and we have whole genomes of all of these organisms. And we see, ah, these are geographically divided along this river system. Now we're gonna call these two again. So taxonomy changes, naming changes with the evidence which is brought to bear to those patterns of variation that we see in nature and we feel we need to give a name to. And another thing that's important about taxonomy is nature itself is a moving target. Just because we've given a name to something doesn't mean that evolution stops. We're in, we're in, we're in one of those physics systems where you're the observer in the whole system. And I'm sure Beckett will probably tell me I'm wrong, but, but you're in a system and, you, and you're, you're an observer, but you're part of the system. So taxonomy doesn't stop just because, just because we give something a name, evolution also carries on. But I just thought I'd give you a background to what the way I think about the work that I do, and I do all kinds of different work. I do phylogenetics, I name lots of things, I, um, I figure out where, where there are new tax. And interestingly, lots and lots of new species of things are already in museum collections. They're already, they've already been collected, they just haven't been given their name yet. So that's another interesting thing we can maybe talk about later. But tonight we have this amazing panel of four great thinkers about how the role taxonomy can and should play in helping us to address our planetary emergency, which is a combination of climate change and biodiversity loss, which has been highlighted by the, by the reports which have come out recently from the International Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. So what we'll do, the way we'll organize tonight is that each of our panelists will give um, a, five, a five minute little sort of their thoughts about, about taxonomy and how taxonomy can address some of these issues. Then what we'll do is we'll have a 35 minute um, discussion between the panelists, which I'll facilitate and, and um, ask them questions. And then we'll have 20 minutes of questions and answers from you, the audience. And, I, and it's important for you to put those questions into the Q&A box, not the chat box, the Q&A box, because that way they'll be collated into a document where I can see them and then ask them to the panelists at the end. And I'd urge you to, while the panelists are speaking, do think of those questions and write them down because sometimes as you get to the end, you've forgotten what you wanted to ask what the, what the first person said. So I'd like to go straight away to our panelists now. And I think um, the order, I'm not quite sure what order we're doing this in. I think Donald, I think you are first. Uh, thank you very much indeed, and um, I too would like to thank the organisers for this opportunity. Uh, I'd, I'd like to say just a few things about uh, species names and taxonomy, particularly from the standpoint of the, the sort of organisations uh, that were listed when Healy was talking, the ones that I've been involved in, uh, and above all, uh, in the context of the work of the Catalogue of Life, in trying to build a workable global system that we can use for talking about species. And to do that, I want to, to start by just mentioning, explaining that in my mind, everything we're doing when we're working with taxonomists and trying to put their work together across all the kingdoms of life is really putting three things together that are intention. One of those is that uh, taxonomy and the listing of species is a fundamental communication tool that we use not just within biology, but in policy, in all of the other organization we make of information about the world's species. And that without a way to refer to species and to have some kind of agreement about how many species there are in the Amazon, uh, it would be very difficult for us to design laws and policy and to keep stepping forward in science. So number one, I think, I think it's important that we think of it as a communication tool. Secondly, uh, and I think Sandy's nicely explained this, it's something that builds on the expertise of countless experts through decades and centuries. And we can't rush that. It involves people getting to know the organisms so well that they can understand the differences and start to see those patterns. Uh, and, and therefore we are really heavily dependent on people who dedicate their lives to looking at little tiny flies or Solanaceae or any other group. And thirdly, uh, as a third part of this tension, we're living in a world where new technologies and opportunities are arising, particularly through 
the increasing ease with which we can uh, get DNA sequences from many organisms and how we can use those to refine our understanding of the relationships between those species in ways that were just not possible uh, in, in past decades. And that as the volume of this information increases, we're able to start seeing some of the gaps and the patterns uh, that were ones we were trying to find through other routes. When we put those things through to, together, I think there are several things that, uh, that really interest me about this work. Number one, uh, if we're going to be using this as a communications tool and one that you know, indeed allows people from different countries to talk about species, there is real value in the mission that Linnaeus originally set himself of trying to create a catalogue of the world species that we can, we can use for referring to them and communicating about them. Uh, but if we're going to have that, we need to be reflecting those tensions I've just talked about. We need to be able to take into account the need for the latest expertise and for the different opinions of different taxonomists to be seen as really important and not a challenge. But on the other hand, we need to be thinking about ways in which we can get this community to work together and to produce the views that will support that communication uh, across all society for conservation, for health related issues, uh, and for the rest of society that isn't deeply invested in one particular taxonomic group. And how we do that, I think, involves us thinking about the ways in which we show very clearly the, the source, the, uh, the scientific basis, uh, and the quality of the, the work that's coming out of taxonomy so that we can understand as things change, uh, why they're changing and why it matters. Secondly, um, and I'll acknowledge this as somebody who's been involved in data infrastructures for uh, a couple of decades for biodiversity now, we're still a long way away from having the kind of summaries of taxonomic information we need. Catalog of Life has a lot of names, it is continually improving, but there are still really difficult areas. And some of those areas are ones where we know too much, like the birds and some parts of the vascular plants where we have different taxonomic groups who, who see these things uh, rather differently and bring different evidence to bear. And we've got to work out how to put those different ideas together. And we have challenging groups where there are very few taxonomists and tens or even hundreds of thousands of species uh, and pulling together all the information from centuries of knowledge is very hard. Um, it's, it's important also for us to be, uh, to be remaining bottom up. The taxonomists are essential. Uh, this isn't something where we can just have some top down legislative approach to building lists of species. We've got to be working with and supporting and giving the resources that are needed to the taxonomic community. And just one last point, because I've probably already gone over. Uh, I, I think as we get more and more perception of species and understand more and more the diversity in some of the really diverse insect groups and elsewhere, we need to start thinking of our current naming system as a bit like the labels that we use inside GPS. But uh, we're navigating around the complex tree of life. We don't necessarily have to put names on every little side street, but uh, having these anchor names that we've been building over decades and centuries gives us the way to talk about different portions of that tree and then add in extra names over time. So I'd like to suggest that we, we may be entering a stage where the complexities of life are even more clear to us um, visibly than they have been in the past uh, and where we need to start thinking about modernizing some aspects of what we do. Thanks. Thank you, Donald. I'll pass now to Maria Marta, who, if you could share your screen, Maria Marta, that would be great, because Maria Marta has made some beautiful slides for us to see tonight. Okay. Okay. Uh, although, well, I'm going to talk about grasshoppers and the relevance of taxonomy in conservation of South American grasshoppers. So although the building of the basic knowledge of grasshopper fauna in South America has been set up, its current status is still limited. Considering melanoplines, one of the best study groups widely distributed throughout the continent, except for the Amazon basin, 
recent surveys that we have conducted along the Andes have shown that the estimates of the number of new species in Central Andes exceed or is equivalent to our count of known species. Integrative taxonomic approaches has facilitated our work in delimiting several of these new species. Man's activities and are limiting biodiversity in these mountain life zones, and grasshoppers can be excellent monitors of landscape use. However, degradation in the diversity levels can only be assessed with taxonomic knowledge. Knowledge on phylogeny is also crucial to avoid detrimental decision in conservation management, such as neglecting population and or taxa with unique evolutionary histories. Based on the most recent phylogeny of the cosmopolitan family Acridae, we hypothesize that the earliest diverging lineage is represented by endemic subfamilies from South America associated with swamp habitats, wet forest and canopies. These lineages of atypical grasshoppers ecology and life forms were only recently discovered in the 1970s throughout the 80s. Also, knowledge on species distribution integrated with phylogeny and ecological need model range estimates provide crucial information about the arrangement of biodiversity across the planet. In the last 20 years or so, there has been an explosion of interest in the field of biodiversity informatics and numerous global databases were created. Among them, the Orthoptera species file is a global checklist that makes available the current classification of the order. It provides a space on the web that brings taxonomic information together with the participation of the orthopteric scientific community it helps to make taxonomic research on orthoptera more efficient. So taxonomy allows us to understand the natural world, building the basic knowledge to manage and conserve biodiversity. The development of new technologies in digital imaging, molecular biology, databasing, and cyber infrastructure has merged with a new taxonomy that can explore and describe biodiversity more efficiently and make our findings more accessible. Synthesizing knowledge, not merely describing species. But no matter how good these new tools are, still what it is at the very foundations of taxonomy cannot be replaced, since poor systematic hypotheses will lead to erroneous conservation priorities and spurious ecological and biological studies. There are still many regions of the world that need to be explored. We have to assure that regional and global species inventories are undertaken in a coordinate manner guided by existing taxonomic knowledge so that we prioritize field work to fill gaps in our inventories. There has been an alarming decline in taxonomic expertise in the orthoptera in the last 30 years. And currently only a handful of experts in the world uh, there are who can adequately describe, describe and classify grasshopper. So training new generation of orthopteries is an extremely important priority. Taxonomy needs more jobs and it is necessary for funding agencies to balance funding for training with funding that makes available taxonomic expertise. Work towards increasing recognition of taxonomy and its importance among the public and funding agencies is still a priority, a priority for measuring the pulse of the living planet. So this is what I prepare for my five minutes. Thank you very much, Maria Marta. And if you can unshare your screen, I'm going to pass yes. now to Alan Weekly. Alan, over to you. Thanks, Sandy. Uh, it's great to be here with uh, everyone today. And um, I um, my initial comments are going to focus on sort of um, on conservation and how taxonomic information is sort of translated into conservation action. So science-based conservation is the best, uh, most likely to succeed kind of conservation, um, kind of like science-based epidemiology. 
That includes using species and ecosystem taxonomy, ranking of the taxon taxonomic entities and inventory of those entities, uh, current on the ground knowledge of the status of populations to optimize conservation action. And that um, amounts to what I'm gonna uh, call th through this uh, presentation, actionable conservation data. You can't conserve what you don't know about and haven't classified, or at least if you do, you just got lucky. I assert that the most important long-term conservation is land conservation, acquiring or designating land for conservation purposes and management. And that depends on detailed mapping and prioritization of elements of biodiversity, species and ecosystems to identify specific tracts of land parcels uh, to acquire or designate. That requires more than hand wavy ideas like the Cerrado is important or the North American coastal plain is a biodiversity hotspot. You have to get down to the nitty gritty of we need this 10,000 hectare parcel. And the reason we do is that it has these viable populations recently surveyed, not herbarium or museum specimens from the 1950s of species and communities that are highly ranked conservation targets. And acquiring this parcel will, or is one part of a thoughtful conservation area design that will meet their needs into the predictable future. I think there's no one true taxonomy, even at one point in time, let alone through time with increasing scientific techniques and knowledge uh, as mentioned by uh, some of the previous speakers and even changing paradigms and definitions of what a species is. There never will be one true taxonomy. Um, and because there is no one true tax taxonomy, efforts to impose on science a system to create a standard taxonomy are ill-conceived. Taxonomy, taxonomy, science, is necessarily messy and pluralistic and trying to make it work through a God committee is a bad idea. In fact, the messiness and pluralism of taxonomic science is not a bug, it's a feature. We need to embrace this pluralism, the diverse views of different uh, taxonomists to suss out, to describe, to understand and to conserve biodiversity. But the paradox here is that good science-based conservation does need to have a level of stability in what the entities are. This is necessary in order to develop and maintain databases of information that serve as foundations on which conservation decisions are based. I think we need to allow science to be science and messy and changing and treat as conceptually separate and sequentially second, the flexible standardization of the necessary data into checklists with associated conservation ranking, threat assessments, and detailed geographic data, and so forth. Again, the actionable conservation data. So um, let me kind of define actionable, actionable conservation data. It starts with a defined entity, let's say a species that we agree on. It could be a genus or a lineage or a subspecies. In addition to that name on a checklist, we need conservation ranking. What is the imperilment status? What is our prioritization of the conservation urgency of that species? Distribution information. Where is it generally? But also where specifically and exactly are the most viable populations right now on what tracts of land? Threats for species we prioritize for focus con conservation action. What are the threats that need to be mitigated? The habitats, the dependencies, ecological processes, landscape needs, exploitation, and with consideration of how those threats will develop and change in the future. We have to be a little bit, um, give forethought to that. Then ideally, the geographic priorities, the sites, the specific tracts of land for the thousands of species needing focused conservation action can be overlaid. We layer those and we can see where we can achieve the most synergistic conservation efficiencies. This is what NatureServe and its affiliated natural heritage programs and conservation data centers do in North America and parts of Latin America um, and other organizations and NGOs do in other parts of, of the world. For instance, where I live in North Carolina, the North Carolina Natural Heritage Program has 2,300 identified sites that have different levels of importance in conserving that state's biodiversity. Those are delineated units on maps that where we know what species and communities are present there. Insects uh, to some degree, plants, vertebrates, invertebrates, other invertebrates. I don't think there's a perfect solution in the conundrum of embracing changing taxonomies 
while developing and maintaining actionable conservation data on those taxonomic entities. But we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. I think the best hope lies in further developing flexible systems that are designed to allow alternative taxonomies. This has to use taxon concept mapping to correctly associate taxa, scientific names, distribution information, and biodiversity ranking information in a way that allows for alternate taxonomic treatments at one time and also sequentially through time. In conservation, it's the entity that's important and not whether different taxonomists treat it as a variety, a subspecies, a species, a genetically distinct population in one genus or another, in one family or another, or under one name or another name. The entity has to be the key, not the name or the rank. For an example of dealing with alternative taxonomies, NatureServe has a standard taxonomy, but also allows non-standard entities for a small percent of taxa. This does create extra effort and difficulty to do and could be prohibitive for any large percent of taxa. Let me use giraffes as an example. People don't agree on giraffe taxonomy and giraffes are probably one of the most uh, studied um, organisms on earth. Is it one species undivided? Is it seven, six, eight, or three species? Or seven, six, eight, or three subspecies? The name Giraffa camelopardalis can apply to the whole or to one third or one eighth of the whole. So the name is also ambiguous. It can apply to um, in the broad sense or in the narrow sense. And by the way, that name camelopardalis refers to an early taxonomic controversy where giraffes were thought to be hybrids of camels and leopards. I guess we've moved past that. IUCN treats uh, giraffes as a single undivided species and gives it a vulnerable rating. Some of the more finely recognized entities would certainly have endangered or criti critically endangered rating if ranked as independent entities at species or subspecies taxonomic level. If data such as threats, population changes, geographic locations were compiled uncritically based on the name Giraffa camelopardalis, when some of that data is associated with the broadest taxonomic concept of that name and some with a finer or the finest taxonomic concept, we would end up with confounded and misleading conservation information. So perhaps a general principle in dealing with lumping and splitting issues is to maintain information at the split level because it is always easier to aggregate data than to try to tease apart data for disparate or overlapping entities that has been put together erroneously. Now for giraffes as mega charismatic megafauna, the finer level entities at species or subspecific rank will get conservation attention anyway, but for 99.999% of species, that would not be the case. And most groups lumped or split taxonomy would determine whether there is any conservation attention to the entities or not. I want to further make the point that there's a tendency to correlation of the distributions, including hotspots, centers of endemism, resilient refugia of different organism groups. And maybe that gives us comfort that we can move forward with a conservation agenda without knowing every last um, species um, or having wonderful taxonomic uh, level of understanding in each group. If we can serve a viable area targeted based on actionable conservation information of vertebrates, animals or uh, vascular plants or partial information on a group such as grasshoppers, we'll capture a lot of biodiversity of other groups, what I call biodiversity bycatch. Because there is no perfect optimization of biodiversity conservation in this imperfect world, we need to just get on with it. With imperfect information now and adjust if and as we are able later based on new information, including from additional organism groups. Local, regional, and national information is important and often richer and more nimble than global compilations. Donald made this point that we need to uh, facilitate uh, information flow from the bottom up and not just the top down. The need for science-based conservation is urgent and we can't take decades for information to filter up to aggregators. Local, national, and subnational taxonomies are also sometimes mandated by law but even when not are associated with floras and ID tools needed for biodiversity inventory and documentation, other parts of that actionable conservation data. So we need to facilitate improved information flow, not just global info. And yes, we need more funding for all of this and more training of a new generation of biodiversity scientists and conservationists. 
but we also need to bridge the gap between taxonomic science and applied conservation. Taxonomists need to contribute to conservation ranking to develop tools for biodiversity inventory, keys and identification tools, engage and improve citizen science initiatives like iNaturalist and so forth. Biodiversity science is real science and with the highest level of societal relevance. The Earth's biodiversity is the heritage we pass on to our children and grandchildren that will tremendously affect their quality of life. So we need additional um, action and focus on this area. Thanks. Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you. And last, but absolutely, totally not least, Beckett, over to you. All right. Um, thanks, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. And I'm, I'm representing in part the Biodiversity Knowledge Integration Center at Arizona State University. So some uh, views and approaches coming out of there. Um, and I want to pick up on uh, what uh, Don was saying uh, to start with in terms of these tensions between, on the one hand, needing to communicate with folks who don't want the taxonomic details, um, needing to rely on experts working on the taxonomic details for centuries, um, and also having to handle rapid change in technology. Uh, I don't think there is a conflict there. It doesn't have to be a conflict there if we don't over-prioritize the needs of those who don't want it to be complicated. I think we can service the needs of, want, of, of folks who want a coarse-grained view and support that, but not give up or somehow have to tamp down um, the underlying work of the complexities and actually put the, all of them together for, for mutual benefit. So uh, being both a philosopher and a scientist, I'm gonna give you uh, three short positions uh, in, in these three slides and just kind of talk through um, why I think this is a, an important alternative to the idea that um, we need to aim at a global list of species names that is driven and, and, and aims at a comprehensive consensus or kind of general purpose consensus. So I wanna start by saying that taxonomic pluralism is consistent with having a reference list for all species names. Um, we just need to understand what that uh, reference list is, right? What are its properties? Well, it's one reference standard among many, like one dictionary among many, um, and it's good for certain purposes, right? Maybe it's good for communicating uh, in relationship to international law. That would be a special purpose rather than a all in one, this captures both the science and the communication needs. So in that regard, handling the messiness of the science that both Don and, and, and Alan were talking about uh, does, I think, uh, require that we not try and force unification and general purpose consensus uh, from the get-go, where in fact um, it would be more productive to encourage exploration and divergence in, in many groups and, and um, changing context of science. So in terms of how this, the list should be run, I think it should be flexible there and both enable the pursuit of consensus where appropriate, where the evidence is really driving agreement, and dissensus, where that is in fact the best way forward for science, reflecting rapidly new changing technologies or uh, you know, uh, productive debates among how to classify. In that regard, we need and, and should aim to scale the presentation of taxonomic complexities with such a list to their relevance for the users. And I, I don't think that's um, in fact uh, impossible there. And it can be done in terms of providing different views on the same underlying knowledge. Um, but if we oversimplify that knowledge from the get-go, like Alan was saying, um, it's very hard to unpack. It's better to start with the, the fine-grained and, and more complex view and um, agree on ways to present uh, uh, a simplified version for the appropriate audience. Conservationists do need to regularly engage with taxonomic complexities, right? It does matter when you pick a taxonomy, what kind of conservation status you get out of that. And if you want to make sure that it's not dependent on uh, an arbitrary choice, then you need to think about robustness, for example, of conservation priorities based on taxonomic selection. And that means that it's not the case that uh, everyone else just wants the simplest, right? There's definitely uh, a valid audience for that, um, but we do need to think about the um, intermediate range here of not just systematists on one end wishing they had all of the gory details in front of them and decision makers on the other end wishing that the headache would just go away, but how really we're occupying an intermediate range that's a continuum. And that should be something that we aim to support um, flexibly. And simply having the simple view isn't going to make all of the contextual variation in laws and science disappear. It's there for lots of other reasons besides the complexity of taxonomy. 
Um, and so the last position here is that we also need to think about um, how are we going to handle scientific change and disagreement within the context of a project of making a global names list. And it, it really depends on how transparency and other sorts of provenance and, and accountability are implemented. If it ends up looking something like somewhere deep in the metadata or a, a, a web page um, you know, uh, uh, part, um, there is information about, oh, we chose this taxonomy and not this other one, um, and here's the source, right? That's transparency in a certain sense, but it um, is still highly consistent and, and likely to lead to entrenchment uh, and, and channeling of resources to some audiences over others, um, to some scientists over others. And I think it's, it's well demonstrated that global infrastructure has a kind of Matthew effect of the rich getting richer and the poor are getting poorer in the sense of those that are in the infrastructure and have um, their you know, classifications or approaches represented in that infrastructure then have the rest of the world align around that while those that aren't um, basically have to then go through that um, obligatory passage point to present their views as alternative or to, to access data and knowledge on their own terms. So channeling resources towards consensus can actually undercut science there where divergence would be most productive. And I think we need to be very conscious about that as, as a um, serious downside to consensus uh, as a general purpose ideal for a, a global name list. Um, and you know, it's funny how I think there's a, a two sides of the same coin here problem where um, we can look at some of the same projects like Avabase and eBird or the Atlas of Living Australia and on the one hand, uh, one person says, look, they have a consensus species list. Um, we don't need to worry about pluralism. And then um, I would look at it and say, look, they're actually handling the concepts and the translations and the alignments underneath that. And that's how they get to have a single species list that they're presenting. I just don't need to see that as crucially a general purpose consensus. I think it's just a special purpose reference standard that's very helpful for some audiences, but not replacing um, or, or substituting for scientific disagreement. But in fact, the social and technical infrastructure is there on either view in, in many of these cases. And I think, um, in fact, there's, there's a lot that we can build to, to work toward the kind of vision that, that Alan was describing of being able to handle the fine-grained complexities while still being able to present a simple and communicable uh, list of species or, or taxonomic agreements where, where appropriate to an outside audience. And that's where I'll stop. Thanks a lot, Beckett, and thanks to all of you for really interesting and very different, differing views. And I'm, I guess I'm going to start by by asking a few questions and then and then and try to get each of you to kind of reflect on them. And then we'll just kind of try to manage it as a free for all. Well, let's see how, how far we get. One of the interesting things that that I found in all of your talks was this thing about um, pluralism and, and um, dissensus. I've never heard that word and I've now learned a new word, Beckett. Thank you very much. I always like learning new words is um, dissensus. And that's something I just want to reflect on a little bit from my own perspective is that is that I know when I do my taxonomic treatments and I write revisions that there are areas where I think, mm, I don't know, this is a bit of a problem. And I, and I perhaps lumped species together that I think possibly with 50 more years of study, I might lump them out. But what that does, that's biology. That's biology and in a way it's like here be monsters. And so if there's a way of, a, a way of saying, you know, here's, here's a place that someone local needs to go in and study this in huge detail, that in a way is kind of creating the space for those different levels of taxonomy to happen. So I just like you guys to think and, and maybe, um, I don't know who wants to talk first, but to, to think about about pluralism, but also pluralism in the sense of having a social infrastructure as well, is how do we get people involved in pluralism? Does anybody want to chip in first or shall I just call on people in a scary kind of way? Alan. Well, I'll just make a quick comment about the, about the here be monsters. Um, one thing that taxonomists do badly is, um, is showing their work. Uh, they often don't actually talk about the messy bits. You know, they sort of sweep them under the rug and hope nobody will notice. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and one thing about, uh, about moving forward that would actually be very helpful is for taxonomists to be um, upfront and straightforward about um, this is a completely unresolved problem that I didn't have time to get into um, and, and flag that. So um, 
Yeah, anybody else have a thought on that? Donald. Um, I, I think, I mean, I think one of the things that struck me from all of our conversation just now was that although we may approach all of this from different angles and from different priorities, there seems to be a lot of consensus around, the, <laughs> the, sorry, around the duality of what we were talking about. But I, I think you're right that a lot of this does come down to sociology, that uh, realistically, uh, we need to be reinforcing uh, what in another context I've, I've called the, the bubbling cauldron of, of taxonomy, that uh, the, it, it's a vibrant science. There's lots of new ideas coming out for many groups. I mean, there, there are some groups where we wish we had more people studying them, so we got more ideas. But generally, especially for the groups that uh, perhaps cause us most most challenges at bringing, building together the consensus, there's a lot of study going on. There's a lot of ideas coming and we need to, to highlight and showcase that that really matters. And, um, and I want us to get to the point where it's easy to start visualizing the, the relationships between those different positions and views and where they differ and where there be dragons. Um, and th the fact that we need some kinds of more uh, standardized, best supported views for certain purposes shouldn't be something that in any way is seen as stamping on that, uh, that energy and that variation. What we really need is to find ways in which the taxonomic, the, the communities of taxonomists who work around a particular group, and, and for many taxa, they're, they're pretty well defined at some scale. Uh, whether it's the the family or the order or the kingdom or whatever else, uh, to find ways to have to enable them internationally to have the kind of conversations that allow us to know this is an area where we're all in agreement or 95% in agreement that this is a good representation taking into account the current evidence. But here are areas where there may be much more diversity of opinion and, and much more challenge in interpreting the evidence. And to, to provide the models where it isn't, um, you know, the, the the bad case that Beckett described, where somewhere buried in the metadata, it says that some bureaucrat overseeing this ticked a box and said, we're going to take that version. But rather that there is a chance for that community to work out that at the level of IUCN red lists or uh, the trade in endangered species, what is the most appropriate way for the non-taxonomists at this point to take into account that, that level of uncertainty? And I think the, the idea of surfacing much more those communities and their views is really fundamental to this having any integrity right the way from the bottom to the top. Thank you. Beckett. Yeah, and I, I do think that um, we do have many areas of agreement there. And I, I think one point that has been emerging for uh, a lot of global science is that if you think of the global scale science and infrastructure and knowledge synthesis as somehow replacing what we know locally or regionally, um, then that ends up being very shallow and sort of being the uh, either the distortion or the, the limited summary of what we can actually compare across a lot of variation. And so emphasizing like the big data view of if only we could have a global data set of where all of the species are, um, that would somehow replace uh, a lot of the local projects and infrastructure that we have, I think um, is not the right direction to go forward. Really what we want is, I mean, we have this new global scale problem and we do need new infrastructure to coordinate around it. Um, but it's crucial that that infrastructure be oriented towards advancing the, the small, like the local and regional scale communities of practice that are working with the data intensively and being able to you know, advance their own understandings, practices, standards, et cetera, in a way that's connected with, but not replaced by what's going on at the global level. And I think that's where some of the tension around yeah. uh, consensus as a general purpose uh, ideal is, is problematic, where what we need to do is, is facilitate disagreement and uh, exploration at different scales but without somehow fragmenting, right? And we need to be able to coordinate rather than necessarily converge on all fronts. Um, and that for me is a really important and fruitful direction forward for, for conversation. How do we make that happen in a coordinated way, but without forcing agreement where it's not yet warranted, right? Or not yet, the, not the best way forward for science. Mm -hmm. 
Maria Marta, do you have something to say about, about pro? I just want to give everybody a chance and then we're going to have a slight brief. I have a special question for you though, Maria Marta, but go ahead. Okay, uh, well, regarding the idea of coming with one list, uh, something that the like, catalog of life is trying to produce, I fully agree with that. I think that also like uh, Beckett said, uh, that it depends on the audience and for conservation agencies and governments, it's really very useful to have one list uh, of, the, of the biodiversity. In our small world of orthopterists, in our orthopterist community, when we have incongruencies <clears throat> with the different classification, we have, of course, a list of experts, and we always come try to come to a consensus of the classification, trying always to be more conservative, not to make too many changes in the nomenclature and the classification, but we always come to a consensus. We always agree when we have the different two or three because it's something very common that um, there are discrepancies in classifications. And so that's when we ask for the experts and try to come uh, to a consensus and agree in one classification. And you always have some uh, kind of, of scrutinies or even now in the new catalog of life that they are the new infrastructure, infrastructure the checklist bank that they are having, you, there, will be also, uh, there will be ways in the infrastru infrastructure that they will allow different lists uh, or different classifications or databases mm -hmm. to be in the data bank, database. So um, I agree that um, we have to put a lot of effort and energies to coming to a consensus and trying to build uh, a common um, um, list of uh, a world list of uh, biodiversity. I think that there could be ways to do it, uh, but always with taxonomists and experts who can um, who can decide or judge uh, when we have these discrepancies or incongruencies in classifications. So that's what about pluralism. I agree. I fully agree with mm -hmm. pluralism. And okay. as a taxonomist, I have to agree. <laughs> <laughs> No, and something actually that it, from your talk, which really struck me, and actually from some of the things that Beckett was just saying, and Alan, and also Donald, is is about the sociology of this. Is um, is um, one of the things that 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 a, that would appear to perhaps facilitate this pluralism, is to have communities and yes. communities that went across yes. across yes. different kind of local areas to global and and became yeah. sort of communities. So how do you feel? And, I, uh, and uh, Maria Marta, you've built one of these communities with the Orthoptera. Yeah. So how, yeah. do you, how do you set about building a community of people who can actually come together and discuss these discrepancies and think about how to, how to implement the difference? Well, yeah, that, that's, the, that's what I was trying to say. That, that's what the idea uh, to do it. I think uh, some way catalog of life, well, Donald has more experience with that. Uh, uh, they are trying to bring the different communities together. Even mm -hmm. they are now uh, um, together with GBF. Uh, so and trying to build uh, the orthopterist, um, the orthoptera database uh, is based on uh, the species file infrastructure, and several other databases are also using that infrastructure. infrastructure. And so, those export their uh, classifications mm -hmm. and the data is to catalog of life. So I guess I was thinking more about the people aspect of this is about how do you bring people together? How do we how do we how do we manage to bring people together? Because to create to have a community, you can have a wonderful database, but that's not a community. But let's think about people. How do we bring people together? And oh, yeah. Becca, you had your hand up about something else, but Donald, you want to say something about that, maybe. And I'd, I'd just say that we, we need to think about this in a very pluralistic way as well, that mm -hmm. our problems are not the same for all the portions of the tree of life. And mm -hmm. um, I think I think for several of the vertebrate groups, uh, and as I said, for some of the plant groups, uh, especially those that are charismatic and uh, perhaps have 
the benefit of a slightly slightly less poverty in terms of the number of of, of taxonomists. Uh, we're sometimes in the situation where yeah, there, there are enough people with strong views and uh, with broad knowledge of the group, because vertebrate groups aren't that big, uh, that uh, there can be really serious discussion and also much more evidence. You know, the, the bird taxonomists are so far beyond many others in now really being at the stage of debating sensibly at the level of different populations of, of bird species, whether they should be considered part of the same species, whether there's enough gene flow, etc. It's it's a completely different game from orthoptera or nematodes or or many other groups. And there's everything in between. Uh, and in some cases, uh, the the challenge we face is is really just supporting the few taxonomists working on a really important group in being able to communicate better, in being able to manage the names they have better. Uh, rather than distracting them from their work. It needs to be open, it needs to be inclusive for every group, but the, the issues that they face are going to be very, very different. Um, I, I've, I've seen in, in recent years um, more and more papers of the kind, there, there, were, there were a couple last year that caused a lot of consternation in some quarters where um, based on um, trapping of, of insects in Costa Rica, people had described 150 new wasp species in a single genus or, or tribe uh, from largely from DNA and host rearing information with very little other detail. Uh, and we can debate whether it was appropriate to turn those into species descriptions with, with names. But the fact is that for some of those genera, the prospect of anybody ever getting their head around the entire world fauna and producing a consensus view that really does give us the kind of view that the bird taxonomists would expect is completely unrealistic. Yeah. Uh, and so it's it's different everywhere. Sorry, I'm, I'm just repeating myself. I'm gonna, I'm gonna call on Beckett because Beckett, you had your hand up and I, I probably kind of circumvented you slightly. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. And I, I was actually heading a different direction, but- um, But go the, ahead that way. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think on, on this point, um, what, you know, the, the notion of a community of practice is uh, consists of folks that are potentially coming from many different organizations or different mm -hmm. parts of an organization, but that have a common matter of concern. So that might be a taxonomic group, that might be a region, that might even be like a type of method or, or data source, um, set of standards. And um, they want to work together to, to set up a process of mutual learning and advancement you know, typically in these contexts around data curation or around the improvement of a taxonom taxonomy for a particular group. And th those communities of practice need their own infrastructure. They need lower barriers to um, having the kind of, uh, you know, web enabled, easy to set up and, and connect across, communicate across and debate across um, infrastructure uh, that we get with, you know, local to mid-sized data portals um, or taxonomic authorities at different levels um, that have uh, more of a community-based process behind them where they can you know, represent and, and discuss mm -hmm. alternative views for the uh, lists or classifications that they're, they're uh, authoring. And so um, in that respect, I think that if the infrastructure that we're thinking about is the, like, how do we serve up and make accessible a global list of names, but we're not thinking about how does that facilitate uh, people connecting across the world about this genus that they're all excited about, um, yeah. then we haven't gotten there yet. We need to think about how infrastructure can um, connect with the project of the global list of names, but give the communities a, a separate space um, and, and lower barriers to their work that's ultimately going to drive quality back and accountability back up to the global list of names. Yeah, I think, I think that's, a, that's a really important point. Alan. Oh, I just had a further comment about uh, sort of the sociology of all this, and that is that, uh, you know, we sort of professional taxonomists are all coming out in favor of pluralism. Um, but I deal a lot with the, with the user communities, um, um, citizen scientists and, and amateurs and, um, and so forth. And um, almost uniformly, uh, they don't want pluralism. They want authority. They want somebody to say, this is the right taxonomy. Um, 
and and it sometimes is is embarrassing and difficult. You know, I'll, I'll I'll express my opinion that these two things are separate species, but other taxonomists think they're merely varieties or just uh, part of one species that shouldn't even be um, divided at all. And um, somebody will say, "Oh, Alan Weekly decided X, and therefore, you know." That's, that's the, the taxonomy. That's the answer. And I, I'm like, wait a minute. Um, you know, so, um, you know, part of that has to do with, the, um, I find pretty uni uniformly uh, that the public expects that there is a God committee, that there is some mechanism um, in taxonomy by which um, the truth is proclaimed. Um, you know, and 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 they don't want the messiness, and they don't want oh, this could be put in this genus or it could be put in that genus, and either is a reasonable alternative. Okay, okay. So I'm going to challenge you on that, Alan. Is isn't that our fault? Isn't that taxonomy's fault for not explaining how it works? And think and, and nobody expects everyone to read the same novel. Well, maybe it's our fault. I, I, I guess I'm not going to be too harsh on us. Uh, you know, oh, uh, <laughs> probably probably we can do a better job of communicating that. But uh, you know, I think it has to do partly with um, any expert group. Uh, the the more general public isn't going to understand all of the detailed workings, and and never will. You know, so. I, I, I'm I'm I, we'll get in an argument, but I'm not sure I buy that because I think that I think that that people are more capable than sometimes experts think. Donald. I, I, I think though that you know, it's, it's not the fault of taxonomy per se. Um, I would say that a lot, in order to understand the challenges that taxonomy faces, we'd have to raise the level of general understanding of the complexity of evolution, uh, uh, gene flow and and, right. and and many other things that um, is is beyond what most people really understand. There's, there's a very natural sense that most people have that uh, even if they, they they know and believe in in evolution, that somehow at any point a species is some sort of platonic reality rather yeah. than something much more complicated and fuzzy and an attempt to put a put a, a label on this constantly well it's about vibrating life it's about uncertainty as well isn't it Beckett yeah I mean I think I naturalist is a really interesting example here because um, you know when you use if you take a photo and you use their app um, it will say you can choose among these 10 species if you don't know what the what it already is identified right as right and so from my point of view as an, not an expert taxonomist I'm like well this one seems pretty good I'm going to put it in and I'm not worried about whether someone's disagreeing about what the species is in the background. I still get the, the validation and engagement. Um, but then it's really important that there is a sort of second and higher level of uh, enthusiast and professional that comes in and says, I actually know what this species is supposed to be. I'm going to validate it as this is the correct assignment or incorrect. And then even behind that, they have committees that discuss about, you know, and track which concepts they're adapting at a given or adopting at a given time. Mm -hmm. And it's important to have that conversation for the uh, people who care about the messiness and the details to feel like their views are uh, included and, and part of the process, even if what I see is always just one particular set of species on my phone app at a given time. But so I, again, I don't think there's, yeah. it, I, I, as, as long as we don't think that having an answer for the initial encounter um, it, it entails that we can't expose the messiness at other stages or for mm -hmm. different audiences. I think that's fine. I don't think there's a conflict there. I think iNaturalist is, it, it, that's a really interesting example because iNaturalist seems to be one of those things which is allowing people to engage with the messiness of taxonomy without it being too scary and without it being kind of experts say. I, I mean, I've, I'm a great believer in, in knowledge and expertise, but um, but I kind of feel like it's really interesting to listen to other people's opinions about, about mm -hmm. things. Because, I mean, I've had lots of things with school children, which have been some of the most valuable experiences of my career. Donald. Uh, I, I've, I'm a 100% fan of everything about iNaturalist, but I'd say that you're actually teaching them the, 
the challenge of identification rather than necessarily the challenges of taxonomy. And, and they're related, they're but related. I naturalist still at the end of the day ends up with a consensus classification, uh, which, which gets changed over time and new things get inserted and, and things like that. But um, most of those debates are really around, is it, is it A or is it B? And relatively few of them get down into the well, A and B, A or A and B may be a a species rather than A or B, and all those kinds mm -hmm. of things. Alan, you wanted to say something. Oh, I was just going to comment that iNaturalist is a, a great example of the, of this tension between the sort of the local knowledge and the global standardization. Um, so for vascular plants, um, iNaturalist um, uses as its um, as its standard, uh, plants of the world online um, from Q, Sandy. So um, Q. <laughs> yeah. So um, the Natural History Museum. <laughs> yeah. So the um, the um, there's a there's a standard, a global standard, and so forth. Uh, but the local knowledge is often uh, differs from that global standard. It takes time for the for the information, the uh, you know, new species getting named or new decisions being made about recognizing um, species um, in the local flora, for that to get translated into floras, for the floras to get translated into more national floras, for the more national floras to, um, you know, get translated into a global standard. And so there, there is sort of this, uh, this tension between the sort of local knowledge and the global standard uh, that, um, well, it's attention. Um, so, um, and maybe that's just a necessary thing that we have to appreciate and live with. So I'm gonna change tack a little bit because we don't have a lot more time for, for the panel discussion. I want to get, because there's lots and lots of questions coming in and I, and I know that all of you are gonna have interesting answers to some of these questions. So I just wanna ask one more thing, which, which struck me about, about all of your, all of your um, little five minute pieces was this idea of perhaps prioritizing and, and and, um, and Donald kind of touched on it with there's, you know, we know a lot about vertebrates and we don't know very much about insects and the fact that we may be using, maybe, maybe naming every single thing might not be the perfect goal. So I would just like to, you to kind of reflect, each of you to reflect a little bit about, about prioritization and how you think, um, how you think that we should think about that with respect to not just the taxonomic community, but also about connecting to those other communities, those many, many other communities who actually use taxonomy. So who wants to go first, now that I've asked a really hard question? <laughs> Come on, Maria Marta, you can go first. Me? Well, um, in the case of grasshoppers, they are hyper-diverse genera that I don't think we need to go into detail because sometimes they are only a very tiny little or morpho species that are only differentiated by tiny little uh, in the genetics or in the genitalia, very genitalia. And so, oh, I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> and <laughs> so uh, we have carpenters working in the house. So uh, I don't think that we need to uh, name all those uh, um, uh, species or sometimes are uh, even from some localities or populations, uh, uh, but we just need to detect in the, in the phylogeny, maybe which are the most important to uh, deepen the, the knowledge and that because there's, I don't know, some phylogenetic interest or conservation interest or some economic important. There are several pest species or uh, that are very important to know in detail the whole group and the whole phylogeny so that we can detect in the tree, in the phylogeny and also detect uh, uh, regarding the knowledge on the distribution and pick those places uh, like systems that could um, um, help us uh, to deepen the knowledge, the biodiversity knowledge of those groups, but not everything because we will not have time uh, to describe and name mm -hmm. all the species uh, uh, of, um, of the earth. No? 
So I think that uh, we have just to uh, pick some groups and define mm -hmm. them and others maybe with barcoding or some mm -hmm. other uh, fastest uh, ways to identify them. Uh, just do that, not, not describing everything. Yeah, Great. not Alan. naming everything. Yeah. Okay, not naming, yeah, Alan. Yeah, so I was gonna say, uh, I say this with reluctance. Uh, I guess um, I think we have to admit that we're in a triage situation with biodiversity and we're not gonna conserve every last species. And so the conservation targets in some cases maybe do need to be clades at some level other than species um, and using other techniques. And on a more hopeful note, um, I mentioned this in my, um, in my intro, on a more hopeful note, um, you know, it, th there is the, the, the business of conservation bycatch, uh, that we get led to important places by one group or another group and, and we do conservation there and we accidentally mm -hmm. uh, conserve other species that are in that same mountain range or that same um, tract of land and so forth. And, Bycatch. And, Bycatch, and, as you said, yeah. I yeah. think I'm let the other two have a very short answer and then we're going to move to the, to the audience question and answer because otherwise we're not gonna have enough time and that would be a shame because yeah. there's some really interesting questions. Donald or Beckett, Donald, okay. go ahead. Um, I, I certainly don't think we need uh, to be worrying at this stage about putting names on everything. I think we need to be focused on understanding the, the relationships and the positioning of, of different organisms within an overall evolutionary history. Um, and probably getting beyond the point even of just simply thinking of it as a tree, obviously. Um, and, uh, and that if we do that, then I think that so long as we keep in step with the needs for conservation and others, we can be thinking about how intelligently to, to deal with the needs of legislation, often to have species, uh, and what that means in terms of the conversation between taxonomy and conservation, uh, but, but also at what point we need to put real labels on, or scientific names, on some of these sections of this overall map of biodiversity so that they can be referenced by others. Uh, but beyond that, um, let, 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 let's just work, work out what we have rather than worrying about the names. Okay, Beckett, do you want to say anything about that or should we move on to the questions? I probably, you'd be good for you, had your, your view, since you're a philosopher. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I think in that regard, I wish there were more work showing when we need um, fine-grained taxonomic understanding and when we don't for, for you know, applied purposes in ecology, conservation, et cetera. Um, lots of times where it's a coarse grain thing, lots of times it's also a fine grain thing. Um, but I, when I try and figure out like, where should we be investing in the fine grain analysis? I don't have, I can't find the studies or not enough of them by far. And so I, I just point toward that as a really important type of evidence that we could use to, to argue for the importance of taxonomic work at different levels of, of mm -hmm. coarse and fine grain study. Yeah, that's a that's a super important point. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna move to these questions now, and I and and first of all, apologies to any of you in the question and answers who've put all these questions in here that we don't get to because I don't think we're going to be able to get to all of these, particularly if everybody has a chance to to answer each of these. So I apologize for that in advance. And um and and there've been some comments and some and some questions. There's a couple of questions um about about um what the units of of taxonomy that we apply conservation to should be. Should we be, should we, should we, should we be thinking about conservation in terms of particular taxonomic name categories, or should we be thinking about it in a slightly more um, cloud-like way, which is what Alan was talking about. So do you want, does anybody have a comment on that? I often think that maybe what we should be thinking at is 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 populations and areas, because you have a lot of. Um, I work on many species which are very very widespread, and I happen to think widespread species of least concern are probably the most important because that's where evolutionary variation is generated. So that's a that's a kind of anti not an anti rare species, but but sort of I think we yeah. need to think about things in a slightly different way. Possibly. So does anybody have a comment on that? I'll move on to the next one. If nobody speaks, I'm going to move on to the next one. Um, people of uh, Beckett, 
go. <laughs> well, just just for the, the sake, I mean, it's an important question. Um, I, it is. I think one of the things that, that has been really interesting for me and, and I want to, to learn more about is studies of how important wild pollinators are for agricultural um, crops mm -hmm. uh, versus you know, uh, domestic pollinators, um, you know, the bees growing in columns at the, the farms. And um, I think that's an interesting interface between coarse grain and fine grain, right? On the one hand, um, what the farmers care about is how much their plants get pollinated, not by which species. But on the other hand, if we want to, and it turns out that wild species do often fertilize a lot of the crops and are, you know, have a, a large responsibility there. Um, if we want to understand how that's going to decline or stay stable and resilient to change, um, to what extent do we need to worry about what's happening to each species? Or um, can we show that it, it's going to be um, largely independent of, uh, you know, whether one species goes extinct in a particular area or not? So I think that would be an interesting context to explore for, you know, how to define species. Do we need to pay attention to that level of, of concern? Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting, that would be a really interesting study to do. Um, there's, a, there's a question here, which I think addresses some of the, um, the sort of global, those global issues is someone's asked, what social responsibility do biodiversity data aggregators have and are they fulfilling it to educate the public and governments about the lack of robustness? I think it means the lack of kind of consensus in taxonomic views to in effect, to help force the public and agencies to deal better with uncertainty. So how do we, how do we, in a way that's really, the, to boil that down to the simplest level is how do we help, how do we help our users deal with uncertainty? And that's a big societal question. It's not just a question for taxonomy, really. Donald, as a global biodiversity aggregator, go. <laughs> I'm not anymore. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm si si sitting in my office in Canberra. Once um, an aggregator, always an aggregator. Uh, look, I, I, th I think, I think the the aggregators have have a role in this, uh, but uh, I do think it is it is a, a broader question. Just the same way that it would be hard for individual taxonomists to play this role. Um, it's it's something where we need to have a, a more joined up approach as to how we explain these things. Um, I certainly think that the interfaces we have in GBIF and um, Catalog of Life, etc., need to be doing a much better job at surfacing the the reality of of that that uncertainty, that bubbling cauldron of real taxonomic activity, uh, and finding ways to represent that. Uh, but to some extent, uh, the role of of, of the aggregators is different from, I mean, I know people tend to see it that GBIF is trying to give a definitive answer of everything. I've always seen it as it's trying to give the cleanest view it can of the evidence it's being given from all sources so that people can make use of that for different purposes. Uh, within that, uh, finding ways to, to bring forward what we know of that uncertainty would be valuable, but I'll stop here. Okay, so um, there's a couple of questions here, which I think come from early career, um, early career researchers in, in biology and in taxonomy in particular. And they're sort of focused around the fact that, that you know, doing taxonomy or having, having taxonomic outputs like describing species or doing species revisions are often not very highly valued in terms of, of career advancement in today's, in today's, um, in today's um, academic systems. And, and um, do, do panelists have ideas about this or ideas about getting fund? It's hard to get funding sometimes for doing what I would call, um, you know, re revisionary taxonomy or, or basic taxonomy. Now I tend to do it in the context of a lot of other things and I quite like all those other things as well, but, but sometimes, but I'm lucky because I work on a group that everybody eats every day. So, you know, that's, it's, it's easy to justify. So, so do you, do the panelists have any ideas about, about first of all, thinking about academic progression, but also more importantly, I think thinking about funding because that's something we can do something about is funding a bit more. Well, funding. Oh. Go ahead, Maria Marta. <laughs> Uh, funding, yes, for taxonomy and alpha taxonomy and revisions also is, is well, there are too many things at the same time. I think that um, uh, funding is necessary and 
if it is just for alpha taxonomy, and mostly for, for instance, in Argentina, there are still several places and groups that are almost unknown and that needs experts and that needs uh, to do the basic taxonomy and the basic knowledge and funding uh, for that, that kind of research is really very difficult. Also, it is very difficult for students uh, to publish revisionary studies uh, because top rank uh, journals do not uh, are not interested in those kind of study. If you don't have a phylogeny, a really um, well strong phylogeny or biogeographic analysis or something else that goes together with their uh, alpha taxonomy, it's very difficult to get mm -hmm. yeah. uh, published. But do you yeah. have any, do you have a sort of um, a solution? I, I'm I'm interested in thinking about about you know ideas. In, I mean, I'm sure that the the brains that are here. Uh, I, well, think of I creative think ideas. yeah. I, I think that the most important thing for me is good just to uh, um, if if uh, the agencies uh, if if we really uh, make the agencies aware of the importance of taxonomy and of of uh, the urgency to still have. Uh, building new careers in taxonomy, uh, that could be a way of uh, getting uh, funding, but it's, it's like taxonomies, we have mm -hmm. to make aware of the problem that we are facing uh, yeah. nowadays. Becky. Yeah, I mean, I think the IUCN Red List is really interesting here because, you know, one of its greatest impacts is directing funding. Right? It's like, oh, this is now a priority, um, not because the red list says it, but that's how it's often treated. Um, unfortunately, the taxonomy looks like it's settled once it gets onto the red list. Um, so it, it would be really valuable if um, we had something equivalent on the taxonomic side where you could say, hey, guys, this group is probably really important for what's going on in the economy or for what's going on with the biodiversity loss. Um, we really don't know what's going on in here, but it's kind of like a, a red list or a red group from the point of view of taxonomic knowledge with strong societal implications. Um, so I, there are, that would be a positive model to work toward where we can explicitly surface why taxonomic uncertainty or conflict matters um, rather than waiting for it to be settled to then get the attention paid to it. Mm -hmm. So that's maybe a, 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 a job that global aggregators could think about, think about contributing to something like that. that would, that's a really interesting idea. Alan. Do you want to say anything about sort of um, funding and and uh, you know how we how we might improve it? How do you, funding is always everybody always wants more funding, even people with loads of funding yeah. always want more funding. You know. Yeah, like, I don't know. I don't know. I think it's tough. I I, I think that the days of um, you know of monographers uh, sitting in a museum for fifty years and working on a group. They're not over, but they, it, it certainly has declined. That kind of funding is just less available than it used to be. Um, and that was really valuable work, uh, but there's less of it is going to go on. So I think I think cases need to be made for uh, for taxonomic work. And, and, some, and one of those cases is uh, conservation and mm -hmm. the implications for, um, for uh, conservation science. Um, so... Yeah. Okay, Donald. One comment from you, and then and then Miguel is telling me we need to move to ver final, very short statements. <laughs> so okay, short. I'd, I'd I'd just say that you know, as as Alan says, it's very hard to justify in the current climate. Not not that it's not important, but justify paying somebody for fifty years to learn how to know everything about their group of organisms. Uh, and I think we need to find ways, and the aggregators can play a role in this, to turn mm -hmm. it much more into a recognized infrastructure-based mega science um, and, and something more like the Human Genome Project, but for biodiversity on life. We're, we're all annotating a tree of life together, and we need to make that something where it's seen as a big moonshot need rather than somebody working very nicely on some accredited grasshoppers and somebody working on some solanaceae as small discrete disconnected projects selling it as a big connected mission may be mm -hmm. part of how we can get more attention and more excitement and ultimately more money yeah thank you well i'm gonna i'm gonna just wrap up by just um just telling one of my favorite things is that is that i think of our infrastructure, the infrastructure of aggregators, the infrastructure of collections, the infrastructure of, of people working on these, is this the equivalent of CERN? 
And CERN, which is the infrastructure for studying subatomic taxonomy, as it were, is not short of money by our standards. So I think we need to think about ourselves as being contributors, as Donald says, to a much larger piece of, of, of the pie. We, we, are, we are working on something all together, even if it seems like we're working alone. So um, I think as a taxonomist, I sort of feel taxonomy is one of those things that we think of it in a very, almost a 19th century way, that to be a taxonomist means you must be a specialist in a particular thing and do that thing for your entire career. Whereas I feel to train new taxonomists, taxon all taxonomy is, is comparative biology. It's comparing things. It's looking at the differences between things and it's looking between the similarities of things. And if we train good comparative biologists and then steer them into these moonshot ideas of looking at things, we will, we will train new taxonomists. So far from many of the questions are about the decline of taxonomy. And I just wanted to end that way because I think taxonomy is not necessarily in decline. It's just that taxonomists are doing more different things now than they did in the 19th century. So we're more diverse. In a way, it's kind of more interesting. It makes it more fun. There, there are monsters out there. There are things to discover. And that makes it one of the really the most exciting places to be in biology today. Because not only can we find out cool stuff, but we can also really make a difference. So over to you, Kathy, to wrap up. I think oh, we're nearly finished. Thank you. I'm Kathy Gooden. I'm the vice president of the data and methods division for NatureServe. Um, so I just wanted to thank you all so much for today. Um, we uh, organized this webinar because this issue of taxonomic messiness and trying to apply taxonomic concepts to the data that are needed to uh, guide conservation is a part of our life every single day. NatureServe has been using concept-based approach for managing our taxonomic backbone um, that we use to reconcile taxonomic data for more than 60 data centers uh, across North America, uh, many that recognize different uh, standards for taxa. So we have a basic set of tools that help us harmonize data, and we're now embarking on a new initiative to modernize the way we track taxonomy across our network and apply it to assess conservation status and map the distribution of imperiled species. Our network is one of the only continental scale initiatives that's long worked to provide both the authoritative list while honoring dissenting views. Um, so we're now working with Beckett and his colleagues at ASU to implement practical new solutions that will be portable to the broader community. So this panel has given us lots to think about as we develop these new ideas and new applications. I wanna thank each and every one of you, Sandra, Marta, Maria Marta, Donald, Beckett, Alan, for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure and, um, and we'll look forward to, to ideas that we can take further to apply them to uh, taxonomic um, challenges to, uh, in, in, to inform our conservation decision-making. So thank you very much. This is really exciting and fun today. Thank you very much for hosting this and thanks to NatureServe, GeoBond and the EcoHealth Alliance for making this, for this whole Pulse of the Planet series possible. And I really enjoyed today's discussion and it's too bad we can't just carry on. So thanks ever so much. Thanks very much. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you everyone. It's great. Bye. Bye. Thank you.